Folks, it is an honor to bring in our next guest. He served eight years in the U.S. Army, and he's been awarded the Bronze Star and Purple Heart. He is the author of the book, Rising Above, which we will get into. After serving in the military, he went on to become a police officer for three years. He is now the owner of the FNG Academy, where he offers tips and tricks for anyone who wants to get into special forces, get selected. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Sean Buck Rogers. What up? Did I nail the uh, get selected? <laughs> did, yeah. Did I, yeah. Did I do no, it's really good. Okay, cool. Yeah, it sounded perfect. It was like, yeah, how, yeah, you just got deep your voice. Yeah, I was, I was <laughs> like, wondering, like, how, how did you get into, like, how did that come about? You just sit in front of a camera and, like, rehearse that a bunch of times, and you're like, that sounds pretty good. No, I just said it once, and I was like, fuck it. That's that's what's going to be, because I don't know what I'm doing. I, did you Have you ever seen the first video I dropped on YouTube? It's fucking cringy, dude. <laughs> it's super cringy. I was like a robot, and I had the... Sorry, I had the camera or the fucking mic like blocking my face, and I was like, "This is what people like. They want to see the mic like a podcast." Yeah. And then so it's like hanging, it's like hanging in front of the camera, just like this. And I was like, "Uh, two five tips to get selected." It's <laughs> fucking terrible, dude. That's funny. But that's that's, kinda, that's like that's, ours. That's the name of the game, man. Like you cannot get to smooth it out until you get through that cringe. And most people are so unwilling to see themselves in a cringeworthy public place that they just won't try they, or they'll give up on it. Yeah. Oh dude, I, I totally agree. Like when we first started this podcast, I'm like, Hey, let's just do it. We're a couple like cop derelicts. And, uh, <laughs> it was bad, dude. Like we had a janky ass camera, like back the background was, it was just terrible. Like it was all, it was all bad. Um, I mean, I think we've come a long way just in the last like 10 episodes that we've done, but Oh, the headphones yeah. I had too. Yeah, it was bad. <laughs> just like found some headphones. But you're right. Like most yeah. people don't want to look stupid in like in a public yeah. forum like that. Like anyone has access yeah. to those videos, you know, and you know, so, but yeah. I mean, it, you got to do it. Like if you want to make it, like you have to put yourself out there and be willing to look like an idiot really. Um, yeah. So dude, I, I, I got a dose of that this morning, just asking for people who want to collab on some stuff, like I shoot up, you know, and sometimes you shoot up too high. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's in, and you, you get, you get a, a dose of reality and people just, you know, it's going to shut you down, but it, you have to be willing to just be like, I'm going to, I'm going to give it a shot and, and see, cause the worst thing that could happen is if people don't watch your content. They, uh, you know, say no, yeah. but, if you don't try, man, nothing's gonna happen. Yeah, fail, failure's real, real. You know, it it happens. Like, yeah, I learn more from failure than success sometimes. You know, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. So let's dive into, um, you know, really, I guess we'll talk a little bit about your a small portion of your childhood and which kind of uh, drove you to wrote your book, uh, Rising Above. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and then we'll segue into your military career, and then I want to talk about your policing career. Um, because I think the vast majority of our audience is, is police officers, um, and military, yeah. but, um, so obviously in, in, uh, covering your book, you know, you, you obviously had a bad, rough, rough childhood. Um, you know, you sounds like your mom had some issues, um, which you had to overcome as a, as a young boy. Um, is that really kind of what drove you to want to join the military is to get out of that lifestyle? Uh, so I had no desire to join the military whatsoever. Um, I just wanted to escape. And I, I kind of found that when I was like, I think it was like 14. And that's another thing I was telling you, I was, I'm listening to this book, um, by Malcolm Gladwell. And that's one thing he talked about too, is, is people with rough childhoods, they suppressed so many memories, um, deep into the back that, so that way they could move on, you know, and they could thrive from, in life almost as if those negative things didn't happen. And so I found myself a lot, like trying to remember like how old I was. And it's, it's crazy. Cause I just think back to what I felt like I looked like. And then I try to guess the age to match that. And I realize now that after listening, you know, to this book, that there's just so much suppression that comes from uh, childhood trauma in order to move on, you know, just suppress yeah. the shit out of it, lock it away. But, um, as far as my childhood goes, like I, 
I felt like I escaped when I got to New York because I, I went and, you know, I met my dad when I was 14 and then went and moved in with him. Um, I was like, screw it. Anything's got to be better than what I was dealing with at home, you know, because in the desert, it was just, which is crazy because I just went back recently to, um, you know, my videographer is doing like a, a documentary, like a mini documentary on me just in my life and stuff. And so we went back to where I was from and I was like, fuck, it was depressing, dude. Like <laughs> nothing's changed at all. Like if anything, it looks worse. I yeah. thought there was going to be, I thought there's going to be some, like some people moved in, um, you know, people building new houses. Like maybe somebody realized that there's some potential in the land and bought it up and there'd be some new developments. Dude, the same exact stores are there that were there when I left. Like uh, the properties I grew up on are just dingy and like terrible it, it's so run down man um but anyway so i i finally escaped and got to my dad's and then my dad ended up um moving to colorado and he was like you're coming with me i was like no i'm not i'm staying in high school i gotta finish high school and uh so then we had this falling out and but to me i was like whatever dude you know like i'm used to not having a parent in my life so if you're just gonna dip like i've known you for a year and a half you know, you, you think it's sweat off my back that, yeah, that you leave. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't give a shit. Yeah. So he left, he left Colorado and then I stayed in house hopped at friend's house. Um, and I, I was like that, I think that's what really like rejuvenated me first was the escape of California to my dad's and realizing that I had an opportunity to change my life and then him leaving and expecting me to fail without him that was probably a real pivotal moment in my life when I was like, I'm not going to fail. I don't need you. And I'm going to prove it. And I'm going to go kick this school's ass and go from flunking out of 10th grade. Cause I had to redo 10th grade. Uh, Cause my grades are so bad. And then, you know, I got a regents diploma. I, I, I don't know what the fuck that is, but um, I passed enough tests that they put a sticker on my diploma. So I think that's better than not having the sticker. Right. It's better um, than nothing. Yeah. A sticker's okay. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> Yeah. Especially you know, if it's a gold things. star sticker. Yeah. yeah. You're good. Yeah. It was gold and it had, you know, the little edges on it. So yeah. I think that's a good thing. Um, so that's when I really got my shit in gear. Cause I, I noticed myself even changing as I was house hopping, like I'm living on, uh, my buddy's couch and I come home and I'm cracking books and they're all going out to, to party. And they'll be like, what, what's Sean doing? Like, is Sean actually studying like the, but they had, they earned their right to, to party and hang out and have fun because they actually worked all through high school. I was failing miserably. Um, so that was a changing point. I got my shit together. I could literally miss one more day in high school. My like probably a quarter way into my senior year. I had one day of absence that if I missed that one day, I was, I was, I was failing. So like I had no room for error. Yeah. Um, and I got it done. I, I graduated and, the only people that were there for my graduation was the chick I was dating at the time and <laughs> brought her parents. Yeah. So, well, Hey, that's probably, like, well, that's probably more important to you, you know, in your life at the time. Yeah. And how old are you? Yeah. Like 17, probably like 17, right? Senior year. I was 18. Cause I had to redo 10th grade. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's funny, so, man. Cause like, uh, you know, obviously in chatting with you before this, like, you know, I had similar background growing up with, with my dad, um, having been an alcoholic and abusive, um, you know, like same thing with me, my senior year, like I didn't even know I was going to graduate until like two weeks before graduation. And I think the only reason I gra graduated was because my math teacher was like, I was failing math. And if I didn't pass math, mm -hmm. I wasn't going to graduate. And so he's like, Hey, he liked me. And you know, he's, I was a good student and he's like, you can come help me out every day after wood, after school and help me build. He was building like a dresser and woodworking class. Nice. Um, he's like, help me build this man. And he's like, and I'll pass you. I did nice every day for two. That's weeks. awesome. Yeah. So see, see that's, that's cool because he saw, he saw like, okay, he's struggling with math. I'm not going to be able to teach him math in yeah. this short amount of time to get him to pass. But if he could show that he's willing to put in the work, then he's worth, you know, taking the risk on and, and bumping up his grade because I mean, that's, that's life, man. Like yeah. what, what is really going to get you farther? The willingness to show up and get shit done as a young man or, knowing how to, you know, multiply better or, or do long division, like, yeah, no doubt good for him. Yeah. And it's, it is really, it's like seeing the potential in people, right? Like, yeah. You know, if you can look past maybe some of the bad in people <clears throat> and see potential, then you well, know, it could change someone's I life. I think he was teaching you life skills and, and I'll be a proponent of life skills over education 
especially in, mm -hmm. in the career paths that all of us took, both military and, and law enforcement, whatever. I mean, you, you learn so much more from these life skills of like, Hey, I have to do something. I'm going to do it. Right. You know, other than like, right. Hey, there's this test you should take, or you need to do good kind of thing. Learn this. That's great. I mean, high school, you should pretty much learn. Most of those things are, are somewhat useful in life, but then we get into like college and stuff. And I mean, I, I work with people that, that have like, uh, one, one guy's got an art history major and he's, you know, therefore more promotable than me. I'm like, what, what the fuck's art history have to do with law enforcement? Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Yeah. And good for him that he was, he, he recognized that school is not the end all be all of what a person is capable of. Yeah. You know, I, I remember that my principal one time he was like, listen, um, no more breaks. Cause I would get kicked out of class all the time <laughs> and try to joke. Cause I was always joking. Yeah. And, and that's, again, this book, it was, it was really hitting me this morning. Cause I listened to a lot of books instead of music. Yeah. Um, but this Malcolm Gladwell book, he was talking about one of the guys, he owns a major company He's a multimillionaire now, but, um, he said he was the jokester and I was the jokester in class, but I never knew like why I knew it was, it was like relief from trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'd never had, I've never heard anyone else kind of like describe how that being a jokester can, can do really, you know, can relieve you from trauma. And he said that for this guy in particular, he said, if you are poor and, and uneducated compared to your peers, then if, as long as you could be a jokester, then you could have some social acceptance and, you know, you're creating a, a place for yourself within your peer group. And I didn't realize that until I listened to it. That's what I was doing. It's like, listen, if I just try to compete with you guys on an education level, um, I'm not going to, I'm going to be yeah. embarrassed yeah. because you, yeah. And you're going to look at me like I'm stupid yeah. and then I'm the stupid kid in class. So I'd rather be the jokester and get kicked out of class because at least my peer group's going to, you know, socially accept me more than thinking, you know, knowing that I don't know as much as they do and they just treat me like the fucking idiot. So I get kicked out of class a lot, but then the principal, um, he's like, listen, no more. He's like, you're going to do after school detention, uh, or I'm going to suspend you since you can never, you never have a ride home from school. And I was young, man. Pro I, I'm just guessing, but you know, 12 or something, let's say I'm 12. Um, and I live like, you know, 15 miles from the school and it's in the fucking hot desert. And he's like, I'm going to suspend you. And I was like, well, I don't want to be home because that plays a trauma factory. And I was like, so if it means avoiding getting suspended and spending more time at home, I was like, fuck it. I'll walk home. So he's like, you got to ride. And I was like, yep, I got to ride. And he's like, okay, good. Make sure your mom comes and picks you up. I was like, check. She's on her way. She's going to come <laughs> pick me up. So I did detention and fucking started hoofing it, man. And, but that's the thing is like, if that's what you have to do, if you could learn that at a young age, I mean, that's pretty, pretty fucking valuable. Like life is going to require you to do some hard things sometimes, whether you like it or not, or whether you deserve it or not. And, um, you know, if you're the type of person that just shows up, and gets it done, that'll probably help in the future. Yeah. Well, I like that. It sounds to me like you were, you're figuring out a solution to your problem on your own, you know, at, very, Absolutely. at a very young age. Like, young the solution age, yeah. is how do I get home? You know, yeah. fucking walk, whatever it is, you know, you, you figured it right. out whether it was the, the good way or the way that people think should be done. Hey, that's, that's up for argument, but you got it done. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You got to do what you got to do. So you graduate high school, you get your diploma. We'll call it a diploma with your gold star on it. Um, sticker. <laughs> Thanks man. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, it was a, it was a special diploma. <laughs> yeah. It's um, not on the wall. It should be on the wall right behind you. <laughs> yeah. yeah no. Where'd you end up after that? Um, after you graduated, after high school is done. So from there, um, from there, I ended up marrying the, the girlfriend that came with me. Um, we were living in New York, obviously. We moved to California. She started nursing school. She was a, a psych major about to uh, – she was on a sophomore, I think, in, in college and um, in psychology. Then we moved to California because I was like, hey, I want to go pursue acting of all things. <laughs> and, and and here's the reason. The, the craziest thing happened when – I met her and like choosing to try this whole thing on with acting is she was, she was very wealthy. So I was working at a tanning salon in high school to like pay for a cell phone bill and like pay for gas to get to school. And like on Fridays when I got paid my thing to like reward myself for working so hard is I would go and get like dollar cheeseburgers and go back to my buddy's mom's house. Uh, Billy, his mom used to let me live there. 
and I would just sit there and eat them. And I was the happiest kid. I was like, fucking hey, dude, I bought myself some burgers. Like <laughs> I'm chilling. This is the life. And then all of a sudden this chick shows up, we start dating and she's like, Oh wait, you drive a piece of shit car. That was, you know, an 80, it's like a 1987 Dodge Lancer, uh, rust and all this shit. And I was like, yeah, I got it for 500 bucks. I was super proud of it. She throws me the keys to this brand new car. And she's like, just take this one, take mine. She's like, I'm at school all day. Take my car. And all of a sudden I'm driving around a brand new car. And then I, uh, I come home one day and she comes over to visit cause she, I'm in high school still. She's in college. And she's got bags of clothes from Hollister. And I'm like, I can't afford that shit. Like, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I just wanted you to look nice, you know? So I bought you just hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of shit. So now I go to school and I'm like fucking decked out in like new clothes. I got a fucking car. Um, crazy. All of a sudden, like the fucking cool kids are like trying to talk to me. Like, oh man, you look so cool. Like, I fuck you guys. <laughs> so, but the point was because of this sudden like influx in lifestyle and money, I was like, what could I do that, that is different? Like, what could I do to just fucking have fun and try something new that, cause I don't need to pay bills anymore. Like she is literally paying for fucking everything. Um, she inherited her, her family inherited millions. I mean, so like money was just not a factor. And so I was like, well, acting would be cool. It'd be cool to get a movie. So I did what I do and I got obsessed with uh, acting. I took, I read a hundred books and took acting classes and we moved to Los Angeles um, and then while she was in nursing school, I had signed with the, uh, Abrams artist agency and I got my SAG card, which that alone was hard to do. Um, and I was stoked. It was going really well, but then I, I come home one day and she was in bed with another dude. Um, so I lost my shit, you know, did the typical thought about killing him threw a bottle at his head and <laughs> punched punched all my uh, picture frames into the wall while I sat there and cowered. Um, and then from there, that's when it was like, okay, money's gone, which I never thought would be a positive thing, uh, but it was the best thing that could have happened. That money was so debilitating yeah. uh, for me because it was just like, I didn't fucking value anything anymore. It's like, yeah, yeah. oh, you want, you want that? Go here. There you go. Swipe a card. Like I, I've never in my life, I grew up poor, you know, and then a tr fucking trailer on welfare, like to come home with a bag of shit that you just bought and then you put it in the closet and shut the door. Like you don't even take it out of the fucking bag. Like that's, that's when you know that you're, you're, you're losing the value of money mm -hmm. and you have zero appreciation for anything you buy because it's not yours. Like some dude gave her a car, her, I mean her dad's, but some dude to me, uh, gave her a card and she's using that to just spend an insane amount of money on it. Uh, like for, for example, when we got married, she, we wanted to go on a, a honeymoon. Obviously I was like, fuck, let's do it. The coolest thing on the planet. You go to Mexico, sit on a beach and get drunk all day. Yeah. You know, it'd be like two grand for two people. She goes to a, um, travel agent and books a flight to Paris. So we're going to stay in Paris for two days, uh, go see the Louvre and all that bullshit. I'm like, I'm from a fucking trailer. I don't even know what the Louvre is. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then from Paris, we're going to fly down to Barcelona. And then from Barcelona, we're going to travel on a cruise ship all over fucking Europe and everywhere. Like to see all the most like leaning tower of Pisa and the fucking Treve fountain. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't know where the fuck I am in this <laughs> yeah. world. You know what I mean? Like, like I didn't need this, but yeah. anyway, so when she cheated on me, that's when I had to refigure out what I was going to do with my life. Um, and that kind of broke me out of the obsession of like being an actor and, um, trying that stuff. So I was like, I was like, fuck, what else can I do? So I want to be a firefighter. So I was in fire Academy, got into a fight, broke this kid's nose, got kicked out of the fire Academy, um, and went and signed up for the police department. I'm sorry for the military the next morning. I was in a cruise off for like five minutes. I was like, what you got? I want to be a ranger. Sign me up. Yeah. And he's like, all right. Yeah. That was God's plan to not make you a firefighter. <laughs> Yeah. You know, yeah. Out of, yeah. He was out, like, out of that whole story, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm just want to clarify. You said you worked at a tanning salon, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I just had to clarify yeah. that too. I, I, I it think, was, how many people know that about you? No, no, I don't think, I don't know if anyone's ever brought it up. I'm not, I, I'm not ashamed of it, dude. That was an amazing <laughs> awesome. job as a, That's as a funny. high school kid. It's just all chicks that come in and I was single. I was just like, Oh, what's up? And then yeah. it's funny. Cause so they would have a point, there was a point system in the, the tanning salon. So like every time you bought 
your your membership, you get points. And then you can use those points for free shit. Well, I didn't tell them that. So I would just be like, oh, you want some free you want some free shit? And they're like, uh, they're like, they're like, yeah. And I'm like, ah, oh, here you go. And then we we I get numbers like left and right. And then I would just deduct their points. I'm like, so I'm not doing anything wrong besides yeah. being an asshole and not telling them that they could have bought something else from the store. Don't hate the player, hate the game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my my deep darkest secret uh would be I, I worked at Abercrombie and Fitch for a little while and uh <laughs> That's See, yeah. I worked at Hollister. I'm right there with you. <laughs> All right. So I, I feel you, dude. I feel it. Like yeah. I, I, I get it. Um, that's pretty funny though. Yeah. I so, walked into Abercrombie one day and my and the lady was like, Hey, do you want a job? And I was like, yeah. I was like, oh, I work at Hollister already. And uh my girlfriend, my ex, was like she was all upset and I was like, what's the matter with you? She's like, she didn't ask me if I wanted a job. <laughs> I was like, Ooh, ah, uh, you yeah. didn't make the cut. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Man, having a selection like, prop. Man, I never got asked any of that. I, I feel bad. Dude, right it was, I, I must've been the ugly duckling. You, know? you had to like go out and like recruit people and you like, you had to like recruit like good looking people to work there. It was that explains uh, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you got to remember, dude, like they would have never fucking try to recruit me until this chick goes and spends like, bunch of money two thousand dollars worth of clothes on me and like and then i start working at tanning salon so it's like yeah, here's hilarious. this dude who's dressed to the hilt in all this expensive shit as a high school kid and like tans constantly so if you really want to for all you kids out there if you really want to spend a shit ton of money on clothes and go tanning and you'll get offered a job yeah there you go there's there's bucks words of wisdom I, right i've there. never been to a there tanning salon so well good for you <laughs> Uh, obviously the cool kids do it. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why I didn't work for Abercrombie. I was working at uh, Home yeah. Depot, I think at that point. <laughs> Although having Dude. to like my, when I went through my interview, like my first apartment I worked at, like, I remember the chief read it and he was like, he's like, let me get this straight. He's like, did you work at Abercrombie? And he's like, what is that? And I'm like, God, <laughs> never mind. I'm like, it's a clothing store. <laughs> but yeah. Anyways. Dude, I get, that's funny. You put it on your resume. <laughs> I did. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, he, uh, was, he was 12 when he got hired onto the, yeah, the PD young. his was, first time. So uh, I, was, I was 20, so I was super young. Damn. Um, yeah. Anyways, there's so, nothing nothing better than a 20 year old brand new police officer. Oh, I'm like you have no fucking life experience. Oh They're God. all stoked. Super like I got a badge. Idea. Bad idea. I, uh, yeah. I know how to do a job. Yeah. I'm the boss. Yeah. Yeah. That's a shut that's up, a, son. Respect my idea. authority. Yeah. <laughs> so you end up in the recruiter's office. Um, mm -hmm. So how did that go down? I just told him I want to be a ranger and he's like, all right, come back tomorrow. <laughs> and so I was like, this is fucking easy. This is the greatest thing. Yeah. And so, uh, I came back the next day and said, good news, bad news. He goes, I got you a ranger contract. He's like, but you're gonna have to be a cook for a little while. And I was like, they have cooks in the military. And he's like, yeah. And then <laughs> the, this like ranger dude in the back, he was from ranger battalion. He goes, you're gonna be a fucking cow killer. And I was like, Oh God, like I should have, realize that having a name for it makes it not good in the military but <laughs> i didn't i didn't know you know i didn't know there was like a subculture in the military so it, to me i'm like i can do any job you need me to do as long as i get ranger i'll switch my job you know like a civilian i'll switch my job right. after um and i didn't realize that in the military you know you have this subculture of hey cooks try to avoid combat and um typically those guys are and girls are viewed as you know just trying to get some time in or pay for college. They don't want to partake in anything dangerous. And I'm over here like a type hungry, wanting like aggressive. I fight too much. And you're telling me basically I'm a, I'm a wuss. So, um, I got into a lot of conflict in, in that job. You know, it was not the best spot for me. And, and then I found out quick that, um, you can't just switch and that it was a nightmare getting out of that job. But, I did it. So how, how, how does that work? Like if you didn't want to be a cook anymore and you want to go do like you wanted to be a ranger, how did you get into, in, into so being a ranger? Ranger battalion is one of the few things that, um, places that their support guys actually go through their training, um, to get in, which is super smart because then even your cooks, your, uh, any kind of support, your Intel, all your support guys, they're squared away to a level to where they passed Ranger Assessment Selection Program, RASP. So they're fit. They're, you know, they have at least basic intelligence. They're fucking, they're with it more. As to where in Special Forces, our attachments just get sent to us randomly. So we, sometimes we get shit hot people. Sometimes we get complete turds. Um, 
that's one thing a Ranger Regiment has figured out. The problem with Ranger Regiment is they can't always fill those spots because how many cooks want to go get smoked for two months just to, to flip eggs with a tambourine, you know? Yeah. Um, that's why those that spot was available and the Ranger one wasn't because all the Rangers are all sorry. An infantry one wasn't because all the infantry guys are like, fuck yeah, I want to be a Ranger. Mm. So they take, they take a lot of the spots. So, but how, it. how it works is your contract is your contract. And that's why I try to explain guys now is like, careful what you sign, because once that thing's signed, it's a nightmare to try and back out of it or, or fix it. Um, so what I had to do was a spot opened up as the Sergeant Major's personal security detachment. And then I just fucking, begged him i was like i saw him in line at the defect the chow hall and i was like sergeant major i heard you need a fucking security for this deployment <clears throat> and he's like yeah but i don't take cooks and i was like mm-hmm. i was like i'll out shoot and out pt anybody you have going for that spot i was like gear and fucking teeth and uh it was the right ballsy move because it was stupid you never talked to sergeant major i was a fucking private right um mm-hmm. it was a ballsy move but it was it was the it was the right person to do that move with i just didn't know it and i got lucky nice. uh, most are most our majors would have fucking beat me to the ground and had their first sergeants beat me in the ground and have my chain of my e6 beat me more and um i ended up sleeping in a uh, a ditch for a week straight because my e7 and my first sergeant were so pissed that i talked to the sergeant major behind their back <laughs> that they made me dig a foxhole and sleep in it for a whole field rotation oh, shit. um so I got, I got hazed pretty good for it, but fuck it. I was worth it. I got out of that job and, and I honestly love that deployment. Um, and there's subculture there too, right? You say it now, like, oh, it's personal security attachment. Oh, that sounds like a cool job. Not really in, in the military an infantryman gets tasked to be a personal security attachment because the alternative is that he's out hunting with the boys, mm-hmm. you know? So hanging out with the Sergeant major is not a fun gig. Yeah. But when you when you take someone whose alternative is flipping fucking eggs in Afghanistan, now all of a sudden hanging out with the Sergeant Major and going outside the wire is the best thing that ever happened to him. So just perspective. Like if you ever told an infantry guy like, oh, yeah, I was personal security, they'd be like, fucking <laughs> cool story, bro. Yeah. It sounds cool. <laughs> it, it, it was great for fucking me because, like yeah. I said, my alternative was flipping eggs. Flipping eggs, yeah. Um, in, in fucking a war, like – not not what I wanted to for my claim to claim to military career, you know, they're like, oh yeah, I was a cook in war in combat. So yeah. so if you're attached, so you as a cook, you're you're a ranger tabbed cook, basically. Is that that's how it goes? Like no, you- so so I ended up getting hurt in ranger selection. I broke my, I rolled my ankle real bad. I got Achilles tendonitis and uh, swelled up huge. So I ended up getting dropped. I went and uh, was a cook in one seventy third in Germany. And in Germany is when I got the personal security attachment job. Okay. But, but like, if, if I, if you were to pass, yeah, you would be a scrolled, um, which means that you're in regiment. You don't have a ranger tab because the ranger tab is just a school, okay. but a ranger, a ranger scroll means that you're in regiment in a special operations unit. Okay. So there's two different. So ideally you'll have a ranger who has a scroll Cause then he's an actual ranger cause he operates and he's a, a an, you know, a, a special operations guy. Mm-hmm. And then he's going to have the ranger tab on top, which means he went to the school. Um, and which is an extremely difficult school, but it's a leadership school. So ideally for a ranger, they want the scroll and the tab, okay. um, you know, and if they made another tab that said ranger on it, they'd want that one too. Because, <laughs> you know, yeah, cause why they just want to own them all. Yeah. yeah. And then but from that's, there, that's the difference. They get people get confused about the scroll versus the tab. And it is confusing. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I guess they both I'm, say ranger. Yeah, like I'm sure there's guys that say. Well, I know there's guys that say like, oh, I was an army ranger, but they, yep, but they like weren't an actual ranger, like you just said. They just nope. have that tab. Yeah, but yep. that's like their claim to fame, right? I mean, I'm sure yep. that that there's a lot of guys that do that all the time, all the time, and that's probably the the reason for that misconception is guys want to. They, they know civilians don't know. So they yeah. just get out and they're like, they're like, yeah, I was a ranger. No, you weren't. Like if you just went to ranger school, you, you went to ranger school, you would in the military, you would say that, yeah, I've, I've been to ranger school. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. It's a very difficult school. It's a, um, extremely high attrition rate. So you should be very proud of that school, but that doesn't make you a ranger. Um, and they, a ranger is an operator in a special operations unit who has a scroll and is assigned to. Uh, ranger battalion and that is a very 
different thing. Um, and for all, if there is anyone out there who's, you know, has a ranger tab and telling people he's a ranger, I mean, yeah, shame on you. You know what you're doing. Yeah. No, I, so in the law enforcement world, it'd be like someone who went to SWAT school and now they're saying yes. they're, they're a SWAT operator or SWAT guy and yep. they're not on a SWAT team. Yeah. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's not the same, but it's the same. It's the same concept, but yeah, you, right. yeah, you went to SWAT school and then you're like, yeah, I'm a SWAT guy. Like, oh, you know, everyone else outside of the police department is like, oh, that's badass, dude. Yeah. But yeah. Deep down, they're they're hitting the patrol just like the rest of us and and hit the streets, you know. Yeah, yep. yeah. So, um, so then how? So from there, um, how did you branch off and, and uh, go to like selection to become a, a Green Beret? So I knew I wanted back into. I mean, my goal was special operations. So Ranger, I got hurt, you know. So I healed up. Um, it took months and months to heal up. Like once I rolled that ankle, I could step on a pebble and my ankle would give out. It was just it was a real bad ankle injury. Um, but I started to heal up in Afghanistan, I was feeling pretty good. So in Afghanistan, I started hitting the rucking again. I was like, fuck, I'm coming back. Um, and I was like, and then in Afghanistan, I started seeing, cause I wanted to be in the action. And the only way I can get it sometimes was when the medical bird would come in, um, to the, we had a, uh, uh, um, we had a surgeon's post. I forget what they're called, but it's a, a field like field surgical team. So not all bases have a field surgical team with, you know, surgeons. And, and so when an operator gets hurt or when an infantryman gets hurt or somebody gets hurt and they need surgery, they could fly them into the FOB that I was on, the Ford operating base. Um, and so the one I was on, when birds would come in, I, the Sergeant Major knew I wanted to help and be in the action as much as I could. So he would let me take his vehicle and I would go help out. And then I started seeing Green Berets coming in like crazy, like fucking bullet holes through the backs of their legs. Like I, one dude was stitched up. Um, obviously he passed away and there's, you know, and then when you lose somebody, you know, we, we get these bracelets. So if you ever see these, these memorial bracelets, that's what they're for. And I remember looking at that dude, one of the green braids that was wheeling his dead friend in and his wrist had about six of these fucking bracelets on. Like Man. I just looked at him. I was like, gosh, damn, like that dude, not only has he already been through it and lost so much just based on his wrist, he's carrying his dead friend, his dead teammate in to the aid station. I'm like, this motherfucker is going to be harder than fucking pecker with lips. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time, wh and when is he done? Like, when is his day in combat going to be done? And when, and when is he going to call it enough or enough? Um, and then now looking back on it, like, you know, God bless that dude. What is he looking like now that war is done? That's probably even worse on him. But yeah. anyway, so yeah. I saw that and I saw that and I was like, I want to be like, if I could, if I could get accepted by someone like that, fuck man, that might, that'd be a big, big deal. So yeah. my, my idea, so then I signed up in Afghanistan for special forces selection. And then I go to the aid station. Cause they're like the, um, recruiter sf recruiter is like yeah dude i don't care that you're in afghanistan you could sign up uh for and you could leave the day you get back for all i care he's like I, but i need a physical so i was like perfect go to the a station and they're like we're not doing you a fucking sfas physical in afghanistan i was like mm -hmm. why not well what the fuck and they're like no and so i had to fucking you do what you got to do you know i was a sergeant major driver so i, was, I went back to the sergeant major and like a little, you know, a little snitch bitch and was like, <laughs> I was like, Sergeant Major, they fucking told me no, man. And not, not, not like, Hey, go fix this. But like, I'm going to let them know that they told me no, because he could fix that. And yeah. he fucking did. Like yeah. he was like, they said no. And I was like, yeah, he goes, hang on. He made a phone call and fucking got my physical done and, and went and got selected. So, you know, it was worth this time. Well, and, and that's probably a testament to who you were. Like if you were a, a yeah, fucking slap yeah. dick. He probably been like, well, they told you, no, go, you know, figure it out. And sounds yeah, like that's you, a good you, point. you earned his respect in some which way where he's like, all right, I'm going to reach out for you. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and he was, he was a great fucking dude. Um, Sergeant major Franco, man, great fucking dude. I talked about him in the book. Uh, I didn't, I didn't name him cause I don't know where he's at in his life now and like position in the military and stuff. But, um, you know, he showed me what a good leader looks like and uh, working for him was some of the best time I had in the military. That's why it's important, man. You should always bust your ass because you never know who's watching. And then like, 
you never know who's going to be your boss someday or who's going to be the boss mm -hmm. someday. Right. So, I mean, you always want to like lay a good impression on people like yep. all the time. Uh, yeah. you know, don't, don't be one of those guys that just like fakes it to make it in front of who you know is the boss to impress them. Yeah. Like, you should always bust your ass. Um, cause well, yeah. and the police department's riddled with that, dude. That's oh, like the, that's, that's the name of the game is, is yeah. kiss ass and, yeah. um, you know, suck up to the, you know, or just like you're on a fugitive team. How many people fucking kiss your ass every time you're around and, Oh, so I did this case, yeah. man. Yeah. Like, it, it's constant. Bad I bet. It's bad. Like, yeah. like, Hey, how do I get on your team? And I'm like, I, I don't, I don't know how I got on this team. You right. know, that's kind of like, the way I look at it. Yeah. yeah. I busted my fucking ass. And when the opportunity presented itself, I was ready. That's how I got on the fucking team. Like yeah. you coming up and asking me, I get that you're trying to network, but you're missing the point is you should be fucking putting away fugitive. If you want it on a fugitive team, go find fucking fugitives on your own, yeah. learn how to use, learn how to use social media and put them fucking down, but coming up and just asking me for basically a handout. Um, but dude, that was in Denver. That was huge. I mean, the fugitive guys, it was one of the most, if not one of, yeah, I'd say like top two money fucking spots in the department. Yeah, that's and like, so anytime yeah. those dudes are around, it's like, <sighs> but if there's two types of people when you guys would come around is like the, the ass kissers and the ones that are like, I got to fucking bust my ass and do this absolutely the best I can. So these guys see that I will fucking put in the work and, you know, and a lot of times is like my buddy GP, he's, he's that work hard guy. He'll fucking stand. You could tell him to stand on the side of a corner and don't take his eyes off a window. He, he'd he be there. You could forget him. He'd be there the next fucking day. still staring <laughs> at that window. Yeah. You know? yeah. And it's like, that's, that's what you do. You put in the fucking work. Well, yeah. and then I get the people I've been on this team for, six months maybe now um so they'll come nice. up to me like hey what what do you what do you need to do and i'm like dude i, I don't know what the fuck i'm doing you know yeah like, you I just mean, gotta I've be here six yeah. months i like i you know I, I don't know up from down ask one of these these ogs who've been here for a minute yeah and you know it's because you know i i've worked with some of the the newer people too because i'm you know to that team i'm I'm a younger one or newer on the yeah. department and they'll be like hey can i do a ride along i'm like dude we, we don't do ride alongs <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No. Like, uh, we do, you know, but you wouldn't be on the team if you didn't, if like you didn't bust your ass to get on the team, like it, a specialized right. team like that is very hard to get on. And yeah, when there's only a group of like five guys of like a, of a department of over thousands of people, that, I mean, that says right. something, you know, that, so, well, and, and then my team's all, uh, for the most part, they're all SWAT guys, you know, the, the transition from SWAT. So they have that nice. tactical yeah, yeah. background. And then, you know, I, I yep. transitioned from, uh, you know, gangs and narcotics detective. Nice. So nice. I have a different kind of, you know, way of seeing things, which, you know, they're, they're, I would say they're better investigators than I am tactical, you know? So to me, I'm like, they're, you know, they're, they're the ones that I look up to. Um, well, that's, that's the, that's the beauty of it. And that's why they love having you on the team. I guarantee is because you're, you're looking at them like, you got all the fucking knowledge. Like, teach me, yeah, teach yeah. me. Gosh, damn. I'm the sponge. Like, let's fucking, let's go, it's you know? Diversity. And, yeah, and then you're yeah. sitting there and you're like, you know, they're just some of these guys are super high speed. And I'm like, fuck, all right, we're we're going into this house. Like <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'll Let's be send in, it. I'll be in the back yeah. of the stack. You guys, you guys know what yeah. you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So talk yeah, I got about, talk give us some uh, um some deployment um as a Green Beret. You know, you obviously you you got to deploy as a Green Beret, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So can you share a little bit some maybe some deployments as a Green Beret and some um Maybe, uh, I know in one of your videos, you share a gunfight that you, your team got into. Um, and I watched that yeah. video that, that was, pre that's pretty scary when you watch that video from a bird's eye view. I mean, that's pretty sketch. Yeah. And then people are always like, Oh, why didn't the bird tell you? And why did you guys run from one guy or two guys? Like, uh, like <laughs> shut the fuck up. First of all, second of all, we don't know how many people are in that compound. Yeah. We know that when we bust that d door, the con the walls are lighting up with AK 47 rounds and it feels like fucking mini explosions happening in front of your face. Mm -hmm. So no, thanks. Um, you know, all these like little gamers get on and they watch war footage and they, they just want to armchair quarterback. it. I'm like, listen, you're, you're there to get to the next fight, not to run in, in a fucking blaze of glory and get shot in the face and then be done. You idiots. Yeah. It's but not anyway, call of duty. You can't just press right. and be back in it. Yeah. Right. So they think there's a, a fucking call of duty game. So, which is my fault for, you know, I put it out there and I have to deal with the, the, 
fucking asinine comments that come with it. But, um, you know, combat for me, and I was, I was so thankful to get it. You know, there's guys that go have like 15 year SF careers and they don't see combat. It just depends on where you get stationed to. Um, you know, like my buddy, Kurt, he's in us with us now in the FNG Academy. He was in first group. So his, de- his deployments were J sets. They were to teach, um, and he was on the mountain team. So to teach like Nepalese army, how to climb mountains and shit, which is a fucking cool. Um, but that's not going to see combat. So I, literally my team sergeant like had, he was like an 18 year SF guy. And I think he had like one gunfight before we got to that deployment. So it was, I was super blessed to like go to combat and get gunfight after gunfight in that trip. Um, and it was, it was enough, it was enough like to, to fill me with, okay, this, this is, that was fun, but it was also enough to make me realize that you can only play with fire so many times before you get burned. And, um, you know, I almost got shot multiple times. I mean, one time we're, we would just went into a bad spot and I, I, told the team i was like hey this is a fishbowl i was like there's mountains surrounding us and there's one way in and one way out and i was like this is a bad spot yeah and they're like yeah well we're going in it's like okay i was like hey maybe we should hang back a little bit and uh (laughs) but and we fucking got lit up from 360 and i watched rounds like come in and hit the ground and it was like everything slowed down and i'm just watching them i'm watching the shooter walk me in just the round slapping the ground yeah, yeah and then like right next to me wham and it hits the interpreter who was sitting next to me and he's like ah fuck they shot me <laughs> he's got a he's got a hole going through the top of his leg and i was like well time to get you patched up and uh you know i got lucky on that one that i didn't fucking take around and i look up and i see you know i don't talk about this very much but i look up and i see one of my teammates sitting in a armored vehicle and pissed me off pretty good he was just staring at me and I was like, the fuck dude. Yeah. So we, we, uh, we're not good anymore. We'll just say that, but yeah, you know, that's, and that's one thing that war taught me too, is like, you know, people have their good moments. There was, there was probably moments where someone, one of my teammates looked at me and like, Hey, you're being a bitch, like fucking hustle or get out of the vehicle or do something. So, um, yeah, war is, war is a fucking mess, dude. Like when you're really in it, it's a fucking mess. Like I've done, I did great shit and I did stupid shit. Um, yeah. 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 You know, um, on the, on that topic, I'm, since you brought it up, um, in gunfights and stuff, you know, um, like share, share like your thoughts on, you know, I've been in a number of shootings at, at work as a cop. And I think, Oh shit. I think as, as a cop and you're involved in in an officer involved shooting, versus like being overseas in some type of shooting like it, like to me i know the the scenarios are two different scenarios and in two different mm-hmm. countries but like to me a gunfight's a gunfight and bullets are bullets and like the experience is pro- probably the same right like being fucking scared right which is normal but being able to like push push past that fear and being scared and like getting the job done and doing what you have to do um and then like you mentioned the guy that's in an armored vehicle looking down at you while you're engaged in this gunfight and your turf gets shot and like, he's doing nothing. Um, you know, I, when I travel around and I teach a class, whatever, I always tell guys, I'm like, look, it all sounds real cool and sexy. And, and you think you're going to do what you want to do in your head, which everyone says mm-hmm. you're going to get involved in, in the gunfight, mm-hmm. um, until it actually happens. And I've been in four and in every one that I've been in. Damn. It's in, four. Yeah. I've been in four and it, it's inevitable that every single one that I've been involved in, not everybody gets involved in it and does, does probably mm-hmm. the opposite of what they, they think they're going to do. No, yeah. um, and you know, it, it's important for people that listen to shows like this to, to understand, like, especially if you're a cop, um, who's never been, been in a situation like that, like it is fucking scary. And when someone's like trying to kill you and shoot you, um, <clears throat> you know, shitting the bed and just sitting there is not, not the appropriate way to act. Like you have to be able to like mentally and physically prepare yourself for something like that and then push past being scared shitless and then move past it and then engage, do what you need to do. 
Um, mm-hmm. Not a lot of people understand that. And I think a lot of cops get into this career thinking like either A, it'll never happen to me or B, if it does happen to me, like, oh, I'll just shoot back and like, I'll be the hero in the story. And like, that's just not how it works. Um, Billy here uh, lost a good friend um, in a shooting yeah. two years ago, got shot and killed at work. Um, when it gets Especially, down, sorry, go ahead, dude. No, no, I cut you off my bad. Dude. I just wanted to say like, when it gets down and dirty like that, like it is fucking scary, but like you do have a job to do. And I want, I want to hear your perspective of like being in a situation like that, where like someone's shooting at you, you're shooting at somebody else, like trying to take the life of, of another human. Um, mm-hmm. you know, like what are the thoughts going through your head? Like in that moment? So first of all, I, I could say, with 100% certainty have been law enforcement and haven't been in gunfights in Afghanistan that I spent a lot more time afraid in law enforcement. Um, because at least on a team on an ODA, we are tactically proficient as a team. Like there's seven dudes plus, uh, that are on the same page. They're all highly trained. They're all, you know, the vast majority, maybe one will shit the bed every once in a while, but he, even the guy that shits the bed, he's still probably a solid fucking dude. Mm -hmm. Um, and will have your back the next one or the next moment, right? It's momentarily, um, lapses of confidence. I think we're very common and myself included, uh, when you, when you're in sustained danger, you're going to have moments when you're the hunter and you're going to have moments when you're the hunted. And you're going to know the difference. You're going to know when you went from the predator to the prey and it's fucking terrifying. It's a horrible, horrible transition. Um, and it, it's one of the worst feelings on the planet. Cause you know, you're just waiting to get fucking shot in the face, shot in the arm, shot in the leg, you know, someone jumping out at you. I've had moments where I was like, I know I'm being watched right now in Afghanistan. And like, like, and then I've had moments on the police department where I had a dude um, cover his face with the, uh, his hoodie, like cinch it all the way up fucking tight. And he's standing in a convenience store. And I was like, something's up with this one. Uh-huh. And yeah. I, I went in, he didn't see me cause his fucking, his hoodie is cinched up like this fucking tight. He could barely see yeah. the, the clerk's looking at me like he's going to fucking rob me. And I was like, I'm waiting for him to do something. Cause I don't want to pull a gun on this dude. Anyway. Um, he, he, ends up paying for his meal or paying for chips goes outside. And I was like, Hey man, let me talk to you. I thought it was wrong. Takes off running. Uh, and then dips into a dark alley and I lose him for just enough of the second to where I can't see where he went. And I looking down this alley and I see trash can shadow and it's, it's fucking middle of the night trash can shadow back here of dumpsters. And I, there's like 50 places to hide in this dark alley. So I was like, not going in there by myself. Yeah. But, fuck fuck that Mm -hmm. i get a call from a detective he had just he's a murder suspect and he did have a gun on him and he was willing to fucking kill me to get away with the crime he had just committed yeah that's a fucking terrifying situation Mm -hmm. to be in and to have to make that decision do i get the guy and keep chasing him down this alley or do i trust my gut and and let a fucking criminal go and i'm by myself like that is something that a green beret is not going to have to really deal with, you know? So, um, anyway, I guess the, the point is like being in a gunfight, it it sucks, man. It fucking, but sometimes, sometimes it's great. Like, listen, if, and you guys would know this, like if probably maybe in one of your shootings, Kyle, but like, if you're the dude that has the drop on the other dude, he pulls a gun or whoever pulls a gun on you and you got the drop on him and you put him down. Hey man, you probably had a pretty decent shooting experience. But all of a sudden, if he's got the drop on you, because we all know that reaction is slower than action, Mm -hmm. and the only reason you are alive is because he fucking missed or his gun malfunctioned, then now all of a sudden, your whole life is is getting like contemplated upon because you're you're alive due to luck, you know. So yeah, yeah, and all so all three of mine, so out of the four, one of them was. I had the re I had the reaction time over, over him, but all the other ones were like, you know, getting shot at first and then having to react to that. Um, but like you said, so the story of like you not running down the dark alley, like that 
you didn't do that because that comes with your life experience and experience in the military, getting shot at, getting in gunfights, knowing the risks of if I go down this dark alley and a gunfight ensues, like I'm in a bad spot. Think of all mm -hmm. the cops that don't have that experience who are going to run down that dark alley and get smoked. Um, you know, it's just, it, I, I, I guess it just, is, it is what it is. It's, um, it's training. I mean, but it, it comes, comes down to training, to, yeah. to training and, yeah. and experiences and, and you have, you have more training and more experiences than probably 99% of most, cops. Yeah. But uh, it, you know, I, I would hope it, that many would come across that situation and go, all right, you know, is the juice worth the, worth the squeeze kind of thing? Right. Yeah. And, and that's a hard thing to do. You think that you're going to do that. Like I was a young cop at the time, so I'm by myself. Um, and I want the guy because you want to prove that if you get in a foot chase, you're getting the guy, you know, so yeah. that like, and that it's exciting because you're, you're, if you're a proactive cop, you've been looking for something like this all night. You've been looking for criminals. Mm -hmm. You know, you've pulled over a bunch of regular ass people and you just tell them, have a nice day yeah. because <laughs> they're not who you're looking for. And people yeah. don't get that. It's like, I'll pull over, you know, 25 people in a night, but every single one of them is like, Hey man, just watch your speed. Have a good night. Cause mm -hmm. you're looking for, you're looking for criminals. Yeah. You're looking for the ones that, you know, they got fucking guns they got the dope they got the felony warrants and you know um so anyway <clears throat> you finally find the one that's like he's up to something i fucking know it and then they prove it by taking off running mm -hmm. or you know dropping a bag of dope or whatever it is it's hard to let that go but then i'm i'm a new cop so i don't even know where the fuck i'm at yeah. and <laughs> you know if yeah. i would have went down that alley i could have been just bleeding out and i wouldn't even have known to like how to coordinate uh, you know, my, my backup yeah. getting to me. Yeah. So being a cop is, is fucking terrifying. People don't get it, but you dude going into a house and having to clear a house with two, uh, we've cleared fucking buildings mm -hmm. with like three cops I know. that the, the fucking alarms going off. Someone's probably in there. Could be a homeless dude who knows he's going to jump out you with a knife. Someone could be robbing the place. Um, and you're going with three cops in this fucking an open warehouse with like a hundred different offices. That's not tactical at all. No. Yeah. But what are you, what are you going to do? You have to go do it. Yeah. Um, if we were an ODA fucking, there'd be like two teams that would, would take on that clearance operation, yeah. like two, seven man teams. Like, Hey man, we could do a simultaneous, uh, multi-cell multi-breach from two different entry points. You guys take high, we'll take low. We got a team on the first floor. A team goes up to the fucking second floor. Uh, call it up when you're done. We'll meet in the middle. But instead, you got three fucking cops walking around hoping that they look in the right place at the right time mm -hmm. and instead of the dude jumping out and fucking shooting you in the face. Well, and not only that, but like you could have a guy like yourself with your experience and then you could be teamed up with like some 20, like myself when I first started a 20-year-old cop having to clear a building like that or go look for something. And you're like, dude, you don't know that, that other person's skill set. So, <clears throat> yep. I mean, that, that dude, is I've scary. Had, I've had good friends of mine and I, lo I love them to death. Um, but he just never had dangerous things happen to him. And there have been times where I'm like, Hey, you watch that door and I'm going to watch this door. And the fucking door come flying out, came flying open because of the wind. We, we, we knew people were in this house. So like it was someone's house and all of a sudden we walked by doing on a different call and the fucking doorknob is punched out of this front door. So we're like, well, that's interesting. So we go around the back <clears throat> doors wide open and there's spray paint all the way down into um, the basement and you could see into the basement. So you have this issue, right? Where you have the first, the main level um, in view, and then you have the basement entry open in view and there's spray paint. So, you know, this is like, squatters or, or someone's in there tagging it up. There's probably someone downstairs. There's a, a second floor. So we have so many things. So I'm like, Hey, you watch, you watch the downstairs and there's two of us. I'll watch the main floor. We can't do this safely without at least one more person to two more people. So we could partner up and split. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm calling for backup. The fucking wind blows the door open and my buddy gets so afraid that he backs out and almost falls out of the fucking house. And I'm like, dude, what the fuck was that about? Like if somebody's coming at you, you, you have to like stand your ground and yeah, you, you can't just fall back, you know? Yeah. And he was like, dude, I, I just, in my head, someone was going to shoot me in the face and I just fucking panicked. Yeah. And that's, that's just his life experience. And that's just 
you know, like you said, you never know what you're in for. Mm-hmm. But when you put fucking Green Berets in a room, I guarantee you, or, or SWAT guys or fucking fugitive unit, when you're on a team, now we're in a room, I know that motherfucker ain't backing out. I know yeah. that guy, I know that guy's a jackrabbit. He's going to fucking run in that door too fast, so I'm going to have to chase him. Right. I know this guy's slow and methodical, so as soon as we say go, he's going to fucking do his little stutter step, and I'm going to stutter step with him. We, you know, we have that that working but when you just like you said random cop you're like god knows what this motherfucker's gonna do so let's just send it and see what we got hope for the best <laughs> yeah pretty much dude. Uh, the, the old roll <laughs> the dice kind of thing with you know yeah. sometimes you don't have an option but yeah. um before yeah. we get too far into the police thing which i definitely want to talk about how um so after your military experience how did you end up even becoming becoming a cop was it like even something you were interested in or did you just fall into it like how did how did that happen so I decided I wanted to get out on that deployment because I was having a bad experience with my team sergeant. And the team was kind of like basically ready to disband. We had one guy going to Delta selection. We had uh, two guys got out. Uh, one guy was getting out to go um, law school. It was just like, we were all so miserable on that team because of, you know, the, the, the way it was going um, in our, you know, anyway, it, it, we were just all looking for something else. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, fuck it. I, I, I was like, I got to finish my degree. So I finished my bachelor's while I was in Afghanistan or I got it started again so I could finish it before I got out. Um, and then I applied for FBI, CIA, Secret Service and Denver PD. And I liked Denver PD because I had a full-time SWAT team and I wouldn't have to leave Colorado. And we loved Colorado quite a bit. Um, I, I made the second phase of testing with FBI and then I had to back out because I was in the police department. So I couldn't make it to the inner, the, um, meet and greet phase. Mm-hmm. And I asked them to reschedule. I'm like, Nope. And I was like any other time I was like, I'm in the police department. Like I'll, I'll go at lunch. Like any, any time I know. Like, nope. It's crazy. Cause like these fed jobs, they want you to like full time, just be available for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I go secret service. Uh, they were going to put me straight to the counter assault team that we were starting a new program to where they'll take prior special operations and go treat counter assault team. So they pushed me through to the, um, uh, polygraph phase. I go to the polygraph and, and just, I thought it went fine. Like she, I, I couldn't stand the, the polygrapher. I thought she, um, was obnoxious and the things that she did were really unprofessional. Like talking about, what do you think your dead friends would think about your answers? And yeah, she was, she was a real piece of work. Yeah. Um, but I was like, you know what? That's her game. That's her game. I'll just let her play it and, and, and move on. And I didn't hear anything back. And then the, so you're supposed to, if you fail it, um, you'll get a better qualified applicant letter and like, sorry, we, you know, we've been better, better qualified applicant. I never got the letter. So months went by and then the, the counter assault team, special agent hit me up and goes, dude, what the fuck? Like we expected you to be here already. And I was like, or start training. And I was like, I don't know. I was like, I'm still waiting to hear back from polygraph. And he's like, let me reach out. And he goes back to me and goes, dude, you failed. And I was like, oh. what? I was like, I've taken multiple polygraphs before. I had a top secret security clearance, uh, in the, the military. I was like, what do you mean? I failed. And he goes, I don't know, man. He goes, you won't tell me why I don't know anything. It's just like hard. No. And I was like, all right, well, you know, your guys lost. Like I'm fine with it. And, uh, so the police department was consistent and it checked off enough blocks. I wouldn't have to move my family. I could, you know, shoot for the SWAT team and be full-time SWAT. And so I was happy with that, that choice. And I just went that route. And so obviously you started out on patrol. Um, Mm -hmm. do you have any good, uh, FTO rookie funny stories to share? While, while, oh, being on, while being on training. <laughs> We've all uh, yeah. You know, I, I had, okay. One. So I, there's this dude, Dan Falcons. Uh, he's one of the best corporals I ever had. I love him. He's been, he's been a corporal for like fucking 25 years. The dude is, is like just a, he's a badass. Like in his head, he's straight fucking wider. And <laughs> And he still acts like that. Like he had actually gotten in trouble. He had actually gotten arrested 
um, for kicking a dude in the nuts, like back in the eighties oh, uh, or early nineties. He's like, yeah, he fucking spit on me or boot him in the dick. And I had to, <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, the, the department was like transitioning away from like <laughs> that kind of force. Policing. And so <laughs> policing. Yeah. And, uh, uh, so he ended up like his attorney called him was like, Hey, you got to turn yourself in. He's like, are you fucking kidding me? So anyway, badass dude he's so great and that that's a terrible story to tell about him but um <laughs> he, he's one of the though. yeah he's one of the few corporals out there that were still willing to get after you know you get those old-timey corporals that are like yep. ah, i'll yep. fucking do paperwork and my you know yeah. he's like fuck it let's go find some shit to get into and we did and uh one time this this chick we're driving and he's like his integrity levels through the roof and he's like, he's old school. So you don't fucking touch women, you know, and, and that, that'll trigger him. So we're driving and my windows down and he hears a chick screaming, crying. Um, and there's a dude and he's like, like acting like he's going to hit her. And so he's like fucking screws, like rips the car around, like, uh, and pulls up. And there's this is like two hipster kids sitting on the side of the road and like the and the girlfriend and she's like uh, crying and stuff. So he's like, "Are they hurting you?" And, and one of the hipsters was I forget what he said, but he got up and he went to punch my corporal in the face. And I'm just watching him like it's fucking TV. And, I was like, and it, it kind of bothered me because my instant reaction wasn't to just hit him to prevent him from hitting my corporal in the face. Um, so. He goes and he just goes to take a swing at it. And I'm watching it and I just grab my taser and I was like, this is what they want me to use. I think because I'm like, I, I'm, so, I'm so new, man. I'm like the idea of just like punching another person um, and being, having it be okay is like beyond me still. Cause I'm just like, we probably can't do that. So I just pull out my taser and calmly like flick it to fire. And I point at his chest and he swings at my TO and almost hits him in the face and I pop him. Bow. And he just turns into a board, just flat, whack, and he's like, nah, yeah. and then falls right to his face. And uh, it was fucking, I was worried. I was, <laughs> I was so nervous after that. I was like, first of all, did I do anything wrong? I was like, second of all, am I responsible for the fact that he fucking light as a feather, stiff at a board right onto his face, like onto concrete? <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, they had to surgically remove the prongs from his chest. No kidding. Wow. Yeah, they went too deep. Dang, you got a good <laughs> shot on him, I guess. Damn. Yeah. Yeah, it works like a charm, but T.O. T- T- wise, I mean, most of my fun stories were with Dan because he was such a badass. He was so fun, dude. That's cool. I He'd always be getting into foot chases and shit. That that reminded me of a, a story, like I'll segue for a minute here, that I had. Like, this is past FTO and everything, but I'm working patrol and got this drunk guy and he won't stay in his house. And we're like, he's like, take me to jail. We're like, no, we're not taking you to jail. So we, we, <laughs> we, like, we, we end up like, talking him in to stay in the house. We run out the door, close the door real quick. Like, okay, he's inside the house. We're all good. He's like, he, we're walk out to the car. It's an apartment sitting there. We're getting ready to go. He comes running out. We're like, fuck. All right, fuck. We're going to have to deal with this guy. He goes, you're taking me to jail. We're like, no, dude, just go inside your house, man. That's all you got to do is go inside your house. He goes, you're taking me to jail. And my partner, oh, I love the, that. my partner at the time is like six foot four, two sixty, just a big dude. And he, he squares up, looks at him, open hand, palm, slaps the dude right slaps the cop right across the face my partner and i'm like and i'm sitting there and like you know i know that he can handle himself and everything but there's like a little struggle that happens after i'm just sitting there like laughing at this point i'm like what the, what the heck just happened here and i'm i'm almost yeah, crying or whatever and then i'm like oh shit i gotta do something but you know long story short we put him in cuffs and he got his wish he got to go to jail but yeah just bitch slapped hey, him. people are nuts man yeah to this He's day like, I, yeah I remind him of that. I was like, remember that guy who bitch slapped you? <laughs> He's like, yeah, you didn't do anything. I was like, dude, I was laughing. <laughs> yeah. My partner got mad at me. Uh, GP, we, we would hit it hard, me and him. And like, um, there was a dude and he was trying to get into a car and I was like, oh man, he's fucking hammered. And I was like, GP, this guy's trying to drink and drive. And I was like, um, so I pull up next to him. He's a big old Hispanic dude. Uh, probably like, you know, six two two fifty. He's got tatted all over the back of his head but he's like going to get into this like Honda Accord. And I was like, we can't let him fucking, we ha- we're going to a call. So I, I pull up and I stop. And I was like, Hey man, you're not about to drive. Are you? He's like, ah, nah, man, nah, man. I'm driving. Like, Come on, man. 
he's like, I was just coming from that party down there. And I was like, I knew the, it was a biker bar. And I was like, all right, dude, well, just let me get your keys. And I was just going to huck them out the window. Probably not the best decision, but I had to go. And <laughs> yeah. so I was just, I was like, make sure he doesn't drive. I was just going to keep his keys. And he, he reaches in and he goes, ah, sorry, man, I don't, I don't have my keys. And I was like, oh, fuck. And my partner looks at me and it kind of hits us both at the same time that he was about to steal the car. And he wasn't, <laughs> <laughs> <Shit>. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't his car. So yeah, that's funny. Uh, my partner like slams him with the door to get him off. Cause he's like right up on his window. And all of a sudden a split second later, like in that moment, I realized that I just put my partner in probably the worst fucking situation yeah. security wise. Like yeah. there's a guy about to rob a car. He's, uh, we pull up his record. He's known violent, assaultive to police, uh, Warren's like, like huge, huge criminal, um, uh, career criminal. And I just pulled my partner right up to him and I'm just talking to him like he's a friend. I was like, oh, I'm a fucking idiot. I was like, I'm so sorry, GP. And then, so he gets out of the car and my buddy starts grabbing him. Cause he's like, fuck this. I'm out. And he's going to take off. My buddy starts like fighting with him, and he looks over and I'm putting my gloves on. And I was like, sorry, dude, I don't want to touch people without gloves. Yeah. Like, I don't like touching people without gloves. Yeah. And he's like, you motherfucker. I was like, listen, you didn't have to grab him until I got my gloves on. Like, why did yeah. you wait till I get my gloves on? Yeah. Yeah, man. Policing is, uh, it, it's different, dude. I mean, I'm sure you got a, there's a lot of fun stories and, and cool things that happen with it. But yeah, like even something like that, you know, like you think something routine or whatever, like, oh, I'm just going to pull up next to this dude and ask him like, you know, check, make sure he's not driving. And then, and then you're like, yeah. that was a bad fucking idea. Did I put my, my, bu- my buddy in a bad situation? Like, yep. Yeah, man. We Horrible just gotta, call. We've gotta, all done it though. I mean, oh, like, for yeah. sure. Anyone but, who, any cop who says, Oh, I've never done anything like that. I'm like, you're so full of shit. Yeah. yeah. Like if, cause you get, and th- that's the thing about policing is like you, you have to rely on your gut mm-hmm. cause it saves your life over and over and over again. But the problem with that is that we get so confident in our guts ability that we start making assumptions about what we know and what we don't know. Yeah. And so it, it's a, people think like, Oh, you're profiling me or you're making, you're assuming this. I'm like, it's hard balance. Right. Because it's like, yes, I, I am like making assumptions about what's happening, but the vast majority of the time I'm correct. Uh, after doing some research, you know, it's like, uh, I was talking to my wife and she was telling me about that, that woman that, uh, found was you know wound up dead after she went with her boyfriend oh yeah and then yeah. and then he wound up dead mm-hmm. so she shows me the police footage and i was like well he's got a mark on the side of his face and i was like bet she hit him yeah. and i'm like it's on the right side of his face he's in the driver's seat she's in the passenger seat i was like i bet you there she's crying i bet you they got into a fight she punched him in the face mm-hmm. um and then i guarantee you that if she did it that time she she probably did it again, and then he fucking choked her out. Lost his mind. That's it, what I said. Yeah, lost his shit and choked her out. I said that all that shit right from watching it, mm-hmm. and sure the fuck enough, uh, she was found strangulation dead. He did. She admitted that she punched him to the cop in the video, and it all played out. But people don't realize that's a cop's life. You you start to look at things, and you're like, I guarantee you that this happened, which led to this, and you did this because you you see it so many fucking times. Yep. Yeah. But then you have to trust your gut and and go with it. But then every once in a while you get so confident. And this is what happened to me in that particular situation, which I've done it a bunch of times. Uh, but you get so confident, you know, what's going on. I pull up, Hey, there's a guy who's drunk and is about to drive that car. That was the, the, and I trusted my gut and I was fucking wrong. Yeah. It was actually a, a, a criminal who's about to steal that car. And I'm a dumbass. but yeah. you know, a hundred times I, I made the same assumption and I was correct. So what are you going to do? You know, you can't always distrust your gut because then you'll run down a fucking dark alley and get shot. Yep. Well, and that's why I always say I have one of the easiest jobs in the department compared to like our patrol and stuff. Cause you're dealing with, you know, citizens and, you know, good guys, bad guys all the time. Whereas like, when I look at my job, I'm chasing the, the worst of the worst homicide suspects all the time. And you know who he is. You know, I know who he is. Yeah. I'm chasing mm-hmm. him. I know every, I know probably more about him than he he knows about himself. I've, I've mm-hmm. been through his social media. I've been through his criminal history. And, you know, I so I know, hey, this is a bad dude. If he does this, this is what we're going to do. Whereas yeah. like, I, I don't walk up to a, I don't do a vehicle stop and walk up to that guy's car. It just, you don't right. just stroll on up there. And in patrol, I'm, I'm sure I pulled over people that had guns that I never knew about. 
Oh, for oh, yeah, sure. Same. And, yeah, yeah, obviously. And, you know, at some point, I probably had a gun pointed at me that I never knew about. Mm-hmm. And just lucky they mm-hmm. didn't pull that trigger. And, 100%. And it's just that whole luck thing of it. it. It really is. Law enforcement, especially when you get to that patrol point in your life, is it's, it's luck. It, there are skill behind it and training and, yeah. you know, instinct and gut. But in the end, it, it's still just luck sometimes. Yeah. Well, because you're guessing. You, you, you're... Yeah. You're taking all that police experience, you're taking all your life experience and you're you're creating a likelihood of what that scenario is. And you're there's always going to be room for error because we're human and we don't know everything. We don't have all the facts, but we have to act based on those assumptions. We can't we can't dig more. We don't have the option of finding out more before you make your next move you have to figure it the fuck out yep. and that's why fugitives is one of the fucking best jobs on the planet if you ask me like if i if i were to go back i'd want to do narcotics or detectives or, or uh fugitive but yeah you that's fucking awesome is you get to do the digging and the research before making uh life-altering potential life-altering decisions yep. but on patrol those poor bastards they don't have that time like that life-altering uh decision has to be made right then and there and you have to make a decision, even if that is indecision. Mm-hmm. That's that was a decision that you made, and now yeah. you have to deal with the consequence of of not, you know, putting that person down. And then they ran, and then they shot somebody. Yeah. When it's, when you could have tackled them. So, yeah. Um, that's what I was talking about with Evan Hafer on on the, his podcast. It was like, cops are just fucking easy targets right now, and there's mm-hmm. there, it's a it's a lose lose. You can't win, and nobody's protecting them. So it's like. If you want to, if you want to make a name for yourself, if you want to have, you know, a fight to fight, um, if you want to be an attorney that goes after anybody, if, if you want to do anything with your career that involves like taking someone down or going after anyone, the best person you're going to find is a fucking cop because no one's going to, no one's going to think twice about you going after a cop. No one's going to think twice about you, um, how shady it is and, and how you're hurting society by discouraging people from protecting society uh no one's gonna bat an eye oh you want to you want to take down cops and and you know uh do a social movement against cops by all means mm-hmm. you you probably garner all kinds of support just from targeting police yeah. everyone's on board with going after police and that is a fucking huge societal flaw that we have yeah it's and a, we're we're paying the price for that yeah oh for sure dude i mean Look at look at crime over the last year with this defund the police movement. I mean, crime has skyrocketed, homicides have skyrocketed, shootings have gone through the roof. Mm-hmm. I mean, oh, but we're, we'll ignore that. We'll ignore yeah. all the data because because it's fun to go after police because they're fair game. Yeah, uh, it's like it's like if you're a fucking bully in school, you know, you, you're gonna go pick on the kid. They're like, no one's gonna have his back. Mm-hmm. No one's gonna come to his defense. Yeah. You, and you just get to go kick him while he's down and ha ha ha. Look at you and you know. That's that's what the the fucking you know movements out there. That's what they're doing to police. Is like, yeah. like they'll. It's just ridiculous, man. It's terrifying. And there was a dude on Joe Rogan recently. He was talking about. He wrote uh, San Francisco, and he was like, the whole defund the police is is basic logic says that that's the stupidest idea ever. But yeah. um, even then, they said you want if you want to decrease. Uh, police, you know, negative police interactions. So, uh, you know, assaults like, or fights or, or what, what do you call that? When confrontations, like negative police confrontations. Um, if you want us to do, decrease that, the best thing you could do is increase the amount of police officers on the streets yeah. to decrease the stress of each individual officer. So reduce the likelihood of them uh, being too tired, being too frustrated, being too fed up, uh, being overworked. Um, to decrease the likelihood that they're going to lose their shit on somebody and, and, and make, or uh, just make a poor decision because like I said, they're not rested. They're not sleeping enough. They're not taking care of themselves. And now you're, you're expecting them to make um, the highest level of decision and, and be like the most perfect, uh, you know, minded straightforward in any scenario in a split decision, but we're adding stress. Like it doesn't make any fucking sense. Yeah. It's ass backwards. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. it's completely backwards. And and because of this movement, you've got cops that have quit at like in mass exoduses, you've got 
people that just aren't even applying to be cops anymore because they don't, they don't want to be a part of that. And so then in return, now you have all these guys that have stayed in the, in the job that are, like you said, they're tired. We're working way a ton of overtime, you know, Mm -hmm. mandatory overtime, um, not getting any sleep. Yeah. You're just overall, you're not taking care of yourself and you're just way overworked and you're smoked out, which in return is going to have a negative effect of what you're decreasing cognitive ability on yeah, like a totally. huge scale on a big and level. then and then the, the stress is beyond what any uh civilian can comprehend so they are unable to to and, and they're not willing to comprehend they're not willing to understand what it takes to make these split decisions um on a regular basis constantly that could potentially ruin your life and then oh, so yeah. police are now now they're dealing with ptsd and um anxiety and stress because their lives are on the line every time they check in for work. Uh, and you cannot do that to a human being. You cannot tell him every single day, him or her, hey, when you clock in today, uh, when you kiss your family goodbye today, it might be the last time. So, you know, you know, do extra, mm-hmm. you know, do it, uh, enjoy it a little more. Yeah. You're like, what the fuck? And then have that not influence their ability to perform the task mentally and physically year after fucking year. Yeah. uh, It just pisses me off. Like, like my question to you is, is so you've dealt with the mental stresses of, of law enforcement and the mental stresses of deployment and special Mm operation deployment. How how do they correlate? Are they, you know, I I know that a lot of people recognize PTSD and everything in law enforcement and in obviously in, in military. Um, are, is there like a, are they similar? Would you say to, yeah. Would you say that going to work for a day is similar to, stress wise to a deployment or maybe, you know, leaving going outside the wire or something. I, I don't know. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of similarities and the, the issue is, um, sorry guys, my wife's got to leave in a couple minutes. We have to, yeah, no. um, yeah. but, the, and, but this is an important thing because this is what people don't get. And this, my anxiety and stress went through the roof as a police officer and I had to get therapy. And the therapist told me the reason for that is because at least in the military, you go out, you, you risk your life, but when you come home, it's shut that switch off. It's relax. It's decompress. People love you for um, doing what you did. The the country is uh, majority grateful. You know, unlike Vietnam, where they're coming home and then getting spit on. Um, I think law enforcement is in a similar uh, thing with that Vietnam veterans were in, where it's you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So it's like you're going to work and potentially being killed and risking your life. And some officers are being killed. Um, but then if you don't get killed, you're also being compressed between society, distrusting you, disliking you and treating you like shit. So she explained to me that like the levels of PTSD in in Vietnam veterans was astronomically high, even compared to the wars we face now. And that's because they're getting compressed like a, a fucking vice from both sides. And that is really hard on the psyche. That is really hard. It was really hard on me. And I was having fucking panic attacks driving into work to where I'd pull over, have a panic attack, fucking get my shit together and then have to go into work. Um, Once those things started happening, I knew that it was it was time for me to get the fuck out of there. Um, But the reason it's so difficult is like we're going to riots. We're doing everything we can uh, to protect society. And then society is saying that we're doing it wrong and they want to sue us. And then our department is telling us that, uh, they, they might be right and that they need to investigate us because they want, might want to fire us on top of sue us. And so it's like, who is on our fucking side? Yeah. Why am I, why am I doing this for you when you, the department doesn't have my back? The fucking, um, politicians in this city don't have my back. The members of this community don't have my back. There's that's too many people that don't support you, and that's too many fucking sides of the enemy, uh, and everyone becomes a bad guy in your life. How is that a good psychological position to be in? That's yeah. that's the recipe for fucking disaster. Mm-hmm. I agree, and um, you know I think that's why it's very very important if you're going to want to get into this job, you, you better you know do your research in what city and, and your leadership that you're going to be working for because that's going to be the utmost, probably most important thing is who you're working for and who supports you. So, um, absolutely, Buck, I know you got to get going, dude. Um, thanks for, thanks for coming on yeah. for us. I, I know you're a busy guy and you got, you got stuff to do, so we'll, we'll let you go. But, um, yeah, thanks for hopping it. on, man. And, um, you know, kind of breaking down, you know, the difference between, you know, war and, and being a cop and stuff and, and your experiences, we, we appreciate it. 
Um, uh, thanks for having me, guys. I, I appreciate you jumping on with you. Put put out your uh, your social media, uh, the F and G Academy on YouTube. Um, how you want to plug yeah. all that in? I know your wife has a new channel. Yeah, so F and G Academy YouTube. The wife started a channel for spouses trying to get selected for uh, you know the spouses who you know they're going through the special operations process with their spouse. Uh, because a, a lot of times they get left by the wayside. So her channel is at home with me uh, for spouses to get the rundown on what their life is going to be like as their spouse goes through special operations. Uh, the FNG Chem YouTube is mine. Um, and, you know, we do a lot of shows and things like that. Uh, Instagram, Sean Book Rogers. Um, and then we have the store, the FNG Academy.com, to where we're trying to, you know, get um, as much product to the selectee as possible to make their life easier and increase their chances for getting selected. So awesome. Yeah, that's it for me. And thanks for having me on guys. And, and thank you for continuing to do the police officer thing. And I, I, I commend you guys immensely for staying out there. Um, because, you know, all I could do is pray that the pendulum swings back the other way and law enforcement start getting the respect that they deserve. Uh, but that's not all I could do. Uh, another thing I do and I try to do is, to be open about it and be honest about my experience. So somebody at least is talking about the rigors and trials and tribulations of being law enforcement, because at the very least cops could hear us talk about it. And I've gotten message. I got a message from the other day from Evan's podcast from a cop. And he's like, dude, thank you for saying those things. And it's like, that's the least I could do. Yeah. And if I get to, and I will use every platform to discuss law enforcement. If I get to Joe Rogan, I'm going to talk about law enforcement and, and, you know, Jocko did it when he got to, uh, to Joe and, and it doesn't matter if it's uh, Joe or if it's a, whatever platform we can get, mm -hmm. like part of my presentation is always going to support law enforcement and encourage them to, to hopefully stay in the fight. And hopefully, you know, for them, the, the pendulum will swing back the other way and we could all start celebrating our police again. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Amen, man. We, we appreciate it. You know, yep. so quick question. Would you ever get back in law enforcement? <laughs> no, <laughs> the pendulum swing no. The other way. <laughs> no. And the, and the reason for that is, is not, is mostly because, um, first of all, I, I finally found something I love to do yeah. and this is, and I, I, the F and G Academy and like social, like doing this, the, um, uh, content creation mm -hmm. has been a godsend to me. It's, 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 been the best experience of my life and i've never been happier and it's almost full circle right remember i started as a as a, an actor and now i kind of act in my own little shows and like have fun doing shows hopefully get back into acting um i got a couple offers in the works right now i might be on tv pretty soon and nice. from there um you know get back into acting and then nice. complete complete that circle so yeah well that's awesome i, I would I, I would not base because i like where i'm at but if I could, if I had to, if I didn't have this, I would and and shoot for uh, a narcotics or a uh, or SWAT or something like that because you know. But fuck, man, it's hard to get on those spots. Yeah, no, no doubt. Yep. All right. Well, we appreciate you, man. Thanks yeah, again thank for you coming much. on. No, I appreciate you guys. Right, Talk to you soon. Yeah. Have a good one. All right. Bye. All right, guys. Um, that was Sean Buck Rogers for you from the FNG Academy, and uh, we can't thank him enough for coming on here. Um, if you guys liked it please give us a thumbs up, subscribe to it on YouTube and please leave us a comment. Um, you know, it, it helps us out quite a bit. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, give us a rating on Apple iTunes. Um, again, that, that does help us out. So hopefully you guys like what we're pitching out. And, uh, you know, that was a great episode. I like how Sean really broke it down from his military experience into being a cop and the similarities there. Um, you know, and then even breaking it down as far as to go is saying, you know, doing what we do as police officers is almost more risky and more dangerous than, you know, having an elite team of guys, uh, overseas in Afghanistan in war. <clears throat> um, you know, that just says something about our career and really how important training really is. And, you know, if you have that gut feeling that something ain't right, then it's probably not right. And maybe you should scale back, um, you know, train, train your butts off, you know, take the advice of the senior guys that have the experience. I, I know a lot of the younger cops sometimes want to be real gung ho and, and, um, you know, the, the guys with the experience kind of reel them in a little bit. And I think there's some contention there. Um, 
you know, we, we tell you those things for a reason or we try to pull you back for a reason, you know? So anyways, um, Billy, do you have anything to add? No, thanks for watching another episode. Um, I think that was, uh, probably one of our better ones. He, uh, he broke down some good stuff and, yeah. uh, gave me some insight onto, to different things too. And, uh, I can't thank him enough for coming onto our show. Yeah. And, uh, if you want to find us, uh, you can find me at Billy at shots fired or Billy shots fired podcast on Instagram. Yeah. I think it's at Billy at- shots fired podcast. Yeah. <laughs> he goofs it up every time. Yeah, whatever. All right. So find Billy on Instagram, uh, Billy shots fired podcast. And then myself, um, Kyle underscore Schoberg. You guys can check out my website, www.kyleshoberg.com. A lot of new changes coming with that. I'm going to be putting out some, um, online videos here shortly. And, um, I'm pretty excited for that. So stay tuned. And, um, well on, on that, just real quick, if, if you guys had topics that you wanted us to get into training and stuff like that, please shoot out a message somehow to us through, through one of the platforms. And, uh, if we don't know, if we're not an expertise or have any expertise in it, we, we know people that do, so we can, yeah. we can, uh, guide it in the right way. Yeah. We will, if you guys reach out to us, we will absolutely get back to you. So let us know what you want. And, uh, again, thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you guys on the next one later. Later. Shot fired. Copy additional shot fired. Shot fired. Shot fired. Shooting at us. Shooting at officer.